and get us live streaming. Here we go. Uh, I'm not familiar with uh, CSUDH. Okay. Uh, this is California State University, Dominguez Hills. It happens to be where I work full time oh, okay. as a social media uh, developer, web developer, video production, all around technologist, crazy person. <laughs> this is the creative no. Photoshop Zoom meeting, right? Yes, uh -huh. <laughs> but this this particular meeting, I'm sponsoring it through my account, but this is for LA Web Professionals, which is uh, a sanctioned Adobe user group. So welcome, everybody. We're glad you guys are joining and glad to have you. Will they be uh, having a raffle afterwards? Yes. <laughs> hmm? Yeah. I, I know what he's looking forward to. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Doug, all your tickets I mean, so. are in. Well, I would love um, for next time, I would love to be able to announce it to my students. So Absolutely. they can join us. Yeah. And Andrew Kramer, thank you. It's so lovely meeting you in person. I always show your videos to my motion graphics students. Awesome. Yeah. Videos. <laughs> well, you have a website, don't you? The uh, what is oh, it? Oh, you might be thinking of Andrew Kramer. That's another yeah. one of our Adobe affiliates. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, that's, right. <laughs> that's right. Never mind. <laughs> that's okay. He's a good guy, too. We, we definitely put the word time. to your students about the stuff. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. I think you mostly specialize in web, though, if I'm not cor if I'm correct, right? Daniel? Yeah, and but a lot of Photoshop and internet marketing and everything else. So maybe one day I can invite you to my class. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Be we have another, I, I failed to mention Andrea Batslotson is also an instructor. Um, she's over on the East Coast in Maryland, and uh, she's also part of the educator community. She's an Adobe education leader along with Hana. So uh, I love that we have education community um, getting represented here. And in fact, here comes another one. Robin Schneider is also um, faculty with, uh, I think, FITM. Uh, are uh, doing Illustrator as well. So glad to see everybody coming in. Thank you for joining us this evening. Okay, let's see. And we are in gallery mode. Everybody's coming in. Doug, yeah. Brad, Alexa, Cindy, hey, Roger. Jenna. <laughs> Karen, Ivory, good to see everyone. Thank you for joining us. Okay. So uh, I think it's a good time. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, again, my name is Anise Barton Thompson, I'm a social media specialist at California State University, Dominguez Hills, but I'm also an Adobe community professional. Uh, and along with my co-manager, wherever he is, direction, Daniel, wave hi, Daniel Kramer. Uh, we uh, are kind of the uh, runners of the LA Web Professionals group, although this isn't our group, this is a group for everyone. So we welcome everybody that's joining us. Um, tonight is, uh, we're really excited because we've got our friend and fellow Adobe community professional, Andrew Cavanaugh here tonight. Uh, he is the manager, uh, owner, runner of all things good with the Photoshop and Lightroom user group on Facebook. And he has a massive community um, that is just uh, doing phenomenal things with promoting, uh, encouraging learning amongst the Photoshop and photography community. Um, we love um, how he engages with everyone. So we're really, really excited to have him here tonight. Um, before we get started, Daniel, do you have any uh, announcements to get get us going before we jump in? Do you want to announce our January meeting so everybody? Oh, sure. Knows? Yes, 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 yes. So um, this is not our norm, as you guys know. We are used to doing these things in person, but uh, we all know what the situation is, and Zoom is our our new way of life right now. So uh, getting ready to plan out our next. Uh, set of presentations. We are really looking forward to having Mark Heaps, who is a Photoshop uh, illustrator, all things Adobe, all things creative presentation guru. Um, he's going to be joining us on January 6th. So if you can mark your calendars, get that on your books and uh, be ready to join all educators, share that with your classes as well to put it on the calendar for January 6th. Mark Heaps is fantastic. 
Um, for those of you who are joining us tonight, as you can see, this meeting is being recorded. So if you miss anything, if you have to walk away for a second uh, in the middle of the presentation, you will have the ability to watch the recording back. We will have it available online on YouTube and on Facebook. It's actually live streaming on Facebook right now. So with that, we should go ahead and get started. And I hope you guys don't mind, but I'm going to spotlight Andrew. Um, and Andrew, do you have any objection to people asking questions uh, during the presentation, or would you prefer that they hold off until uh, no, a certain No, they can point? ask. That's okay. And it goes with the, the process. Yeah. You got it. Okay, so the floor is yours, Andrew. Take it away. Great. So should I introduce Thanks. myself or just jump in or? Yes, sir. <laughs> Give us a little background. Give us a little. Right, right, right. Uh, <laughs> so, yep, Andrew Cavanaugh, I'm a, uh, a digital artist. I do uh, Photoshop and Lightroom tutoring, and I do photo editing, uh, you know, photo retouching, photo compositing. Um, basically, back in the 90s, started taking class at School of Visual Arts for Photoshop, and the pace seemed to be a little slow, so I started buying those uh like Photoshop Bibles, the very big books. I think the first one was uh, Deke McClelland. And I studied that and I built up a portfolio. Uh, I got uh, registered with some creative temp agencies in New York and got my foot in the door with advertising. So I worked for various advertising agencies. I think I worked for Young and Rubicom. Um, well, I think it was Tarlo, Tarlo and Partners, I think during the day. And then at nighttime, I'd jump in a cab with my... Uh, supervisor and we'd work an evening shift at Young and Rubicon and uh, a lot of photo compositing retouching work um, through the 90s and then moved to San Francisco where I caught like the last year of the dot-com boom and then uh, but that was good to learn kind of a lot of image production kind of techniques and then I moved to uh, LA around 2003 I think it is now so been here a while now where I do uh, various freelance uh, tutoring and uh, photo editing work and work on my art, my digital art. Okay, so uh, shall I begin? Absolutely. Okay, great. We're all set. And you can hear and me just fine, right? We can hear you pretty, pretty fine. You're a little low volume, um, but I think if you're right on your mic, you're, you should be good to go. And uh, okay, I just how about, remind how about now? Is that better? Nice and clear. Okay. And uh, just want to remind everybody, um, we are we use the chat, so you're, feel free to open the chat panel at the bottom of your screen or in the upper right corner if you're on a mobile device. Um, ask questions, chime in, um, give feedback, whatever you'd like to do, and we'll be putting some notes in from time to time. Uh, and I think we're ready to go. Go for it, Andrew. Okay, great. Okay, so as you can see, I'm in Photoshop. I've got various images open. Um, a lot of times the imagery that I work on is a mixture of my own photograph, as well as, as you can see by the titles of a lot of these uh, different images, I use stock from Pexels. So that's P-E-X-E-L-S dot com. And uh, as an example, um, and I'm not sure what the, the range of skill is, so I'll try to show a good range from beginner to advanced. So if I was going to create a new document, you could go file new. But as you can see on the right here in the menu, that's also command N, which I tend to like to use. And then there's a bunch of different kinds of presets. So um, I tend to try to make my images at least, uh, you know, 12 inches by 12 inches. And then I can always resize them down for say Facebook or Instagram. Uh, but I have found out that uh, working at 2048 by 2048 is a good size, uh, which I believe it's now set here because I've used it so many uh, different times. So when I just click that, it is a 2048 by 2048 on the right with 300 pixels per inch resolution set to the RGB color mode. And the color profile is sRGB which tends to be the most uh, utilized color profile now, not only for the web, but even for print houses. A lot of time when I'm working on clients work, they still wanna keep the color profile kind of focused to sRGB. So up here, I could just, you know, title it anything. So I call it art, hit enter return. And I just have a new document. 
And then to bring over an image, I go to this image. Uh, there's two ways of doing that. The uh, one way is with the move tool. You go to the middle of your image, holding the shift key, you can click and drag, and it drags it over into the new document. And the one way that I tend to utilize most is in the layers panel, where it says background, I just click on that, holding the shift key, and drag it to the middle. And then once I do that, I tend to shut the uh, stock image or the photo that I have open. So here we are in the new doc. If I hit the F key, then I get a neutral gray background. And that's the way that I like to work where my canvas is set to that. So I'm not uh, distracted by all the other uh, different images that are open. Uh, in general, if I was going to make this image larger, in this case, I'll probably make it smaller, but if I was gonna make it larger, I would right click and convert it to a smart object. When I convert it to a smart object, you see this little icon in the bottom right. So when I do a command T to transform, and I'm on a Mac, so I do command, but I'll try to do both PC keyboard shortcuts as well. Command T for transform on a Mac, control T on a PC. And then I tend to do a command zero or control zero on a PC. So I can then see the bounding box. Holding the option key on a Mac, Alt on a PC, I can pull it in to resize. So like I said, in this case, I'm resizing a little bit smaller, which I didn't necessarily need to create a smart object. But in this case, I did that if I was going to also make it larger. Uh, when you create a smart object, it tends to keep all the original information. And so when you resize something, it gets less pixelated. Okay. And then because I'm going to be doing like a photo montage, I will right click again and I will rasterize the layer. Um, so I don't want any restrictions on that layer. Okay, so I hit F again, and then I'm going over to this image. And this will be a good uh, image to also preview. Hopefully they'll be working some of the new uh, selection tools. So um, whenever I'm going to knock out the background from something, I tend to do a command J, which makes a new layer, duplicate a layer. And then now if you go down to like the fourth tool down to the object selection tool, you'll then notice in the options bar and a good way of working too is whenever you are using the tools is to always uh, look up at the top for the options bar to see what the options are for that particular tool. So in this case, when I choose the object selection tool with the latest version of Photoshop, Photoshop 2022, You'll see that now has an object finder. And then if you click on this kind of refresh dial, it's kind of reading your image. I believe it's using Adobe Sensei, the artificial intelligence. And then just by hovering, not even clicking, but hovering it now does this highlight. And then if I click, it then selects the image for me. So there's a new kind of artificial intelligence that is focusing on the image, separating it from the background. So once I do that, I can then make sure that I'm right click and then I feather the edge. So I do use a, um, for something that's realistic, I might just use a one pixel radius for the feathering. Uh, the higher you go, the softer the edges. So one pixel for something like this. And then if it was something like clouds, I might use like a 12 or a 14. So it has a soft edge. Same with like the moon, if I wanted the moon to have a kind of a glow effect. So I can say, okay. And then if I go down to the bottom of the layers panel and I click on the layer mask icon, it will knock out the background for me. And so you can see the preview in the uh, top right here of the layers panel, the right frame that the black is showing you that when you add the layer mask, it, it adds black to the background to knock out the opposite of your selection. And so it's a nice way of working because you can bring back information if you needed to. So if I choose a brush and you can usually hit the 
B key. There we go. Oh, it's taking. <laughs> and then a brush comes up. And so if I have, instead of black, if I have white is my foreground, and then I paint something like this, um, let me do a command Z and then change the opacity to 100. If I do something like this, then it will bring back that information that was there originally. So if I go up to the layer mask and I hold down the shift key, it turns it off temporarily. And if I hold down the option key, alt on a PC, you see what the mask is doing. Black is knocking out, white is preserving the subject. So option click again. So hit F a couple of times. And then all I do is go over to that layer one in the top, shift click, drag it over to my one document with the background, do a command T. And then once again, you cannot see the bounding box. So I do a command zero, shows me the bounding box of the transform tool, holding option, I can then resize my image. So I don't even know what this image is gonna be like. I'm kind of free form creating it artistically, but I've got some ideas in mind. Um, I was about to ask you, how do you, how do you come up with these ideas? I know you, you basically create daily. So when you get an idea, what, what is it that's bringing you to the process that allows you to do these composites? Right. Right. So I, I tend to um, have different um, kind of dream imagery or like an idea that comes up and, uh, you know, during the daytime, I do a lot of different um, freelance work, but then at nighttime, I do tend to like uh, watching Netflix. So I'll watch different kinds of movies. Um, and a lot of times uh, I have a good tolerance with movies where <laughs> um, my, my wife might be a little annoyed by it too, is that uh, might not necessarily be a good movie, but I might like the color grading to it. So I tend to watch a lot of different kinds of sci-fi, horror movies, thrillers, um, European TV shows, European movies. Um, just to see the different kind of aesthetic sensibilities. And um, so I might get ideas from that. And, um, and and like I said, my dreams or, you know, just different kind of concepts that come. So in this case, um, I brought that image over. So I might uh, close that. I don't need that anymore. And then a good thing to do is once you're starting to build your uh, composite, you should always do a file save as, and then just going to go to say desktop and just save it as a PSD. Okay, so I don't wanna lose anything I've done. Okay, hit F a couple times, get back. And then on my keyboard, the F3 key will give me a nice view of the different things that I have open. So this is the first thing I wanted to kind of interact with the image. So same concept. I go over to the file. I go over to the layers panel, which is background. I just shift drag it over and it centers it. I can then go back to the original. And then you can either do a command W on a Mac, control W on a PC, or hit the red dot to close it. And then when it's here, um, now, I do have a little bit of a, a cheat. I do have various uh, actions that I've created. So if I open up my actions, I do have one for guides. So the minute I click on guides, I have a 50% uh, or perfectly centered vertical and horizontal guide. So that's always a good way to uh, make sure that my images are lined up. So I make sure I'm in the move tool and I just nudge it with the left arrow and just make it uh, so it's pretty much centered. Command uh, semicolon will hide the guides. And then the way that I like to uh, work with my kind of artist compositions is I am aware that when I go to the layer blending modes, there's different sections. So the first section, you know, there's darken and multiply. That'll make it so that the, the image will kind of read the information from the layers that are below it and it will get darker. So it's, you know, darkening that background a bit. And then the opposite happens where 
when you go to lighten this section, the top layer will be highlighted and then the dark areas of that image will be kind of knocked out. And so you get this kind of effect. And then you have like overlay, which is kind of in between like a mid range. And then it gets down to like these kind of almost filter effects and then a focus on color. So you will take on the different color of saturation or color from the top layer. What I like to do is choosing the move tool. I'll then hold the shift plus key and then it'll cycle through for me. So I can just cycle, I can just focus visually on the image and just, I'm waiting for, you know, what looks good to me. So I like something like that where it might have a mixture of the two worlds. And so I see a bit of the, I see the original bridge with the kind of forest. And then I see this um, kind of tunnel uh, diagram or geometric shape coming through. And then I tend to like to turn on and off my layers a lot to just kind of see how it's interreacting. And then I'll look at the image and I'll say that I like certain parts of it, but other parts are distracting. So I tend to click on the add layer mask button at the bottom, which gives you a fresh new layer mask. I switch the foreground color to black, choose my brush, and I use the left or right bracket keys to uh, get a larger or smaller brush. So left is smaller, right is larger. And then once again, like I said, whenever you choose a tool, it's always best to look up at the options bar. And in this case, it says that my opacity is set to 100, which is like the strength of the brush. So I'll keep it to that. And then as I paint, you'll see that it's bringing some more of the image that's behind it and getting rid of that kind of stripe that's going down the middle. So I see that and then, so as I paint, it's bringing back more of this kind of sculpture face and getting rid of any other remnants that might be around. And then I see that there was like a little bit of a line at the bottom, so I'm cleaning that up as well. Just want to bring that out. Okay. And then Command S, I save as I go. And then, so the top layer is set to soft light and then does this kind of mix. So I'm curious if I then choose the kind of main subject layer and I'm in my move tool once again and I hold the shift plus key. I can cycle through and see how that interreacts. I'm trying to look for something that's kind of like ghost like Yeah, so something like that has a, a nice uh, effect where it has the contrast of the image. And I might bring it up. I think I like it like that. Yep. Is there a question? Sounds like Daniel or something. No? No, I think they're good. Go ahead. <laughs> talking to his daughter or something. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so something like that. And then I just hit F a couple of times and then I can hit the F3 key, gives me this. So then I have something like this that has a lot of texture and color that I can also bring in. So shift, drag over, brings it over. I hit F to get into this view, command T and then command zero to resize. Do something like that. And then I'll hit the uh, shift plus again to cycle through and see how that interreacts. I kind of like that. Let's lighten mode again. I imagine that when we get the overlay is good, but a little dark. I kind of like that one. So that's exclusion. That's letting the uh, subject come through a bit. I see a bit of the original background mingled with some of that kind of geometric shape. And then the uh, top, this layer of the kind of under, underworld, underwater world. And then once again, I still want to let some of the other imagery through. So I just click on the add layer mask, choose my brush, right bracket to make it larger. And in this case, I want it to be more subtle. 
kind of a medium blend. So when I choose my brush, I look up at the top. I don't want the opacity to be 100. So all I do is hover my cursor over the word opacity and you get what they call a scrubby slider. A hand comes up with two arrows and then I can just click and then pull to the left and I'm gonna bring it down to about 30, 31 is fine. Yeah. And then it's set to black, so it'll erase. And I just kind of take a look at what I wanna bring back. So then as I paint, it's bringing back partially the original information. And so I'm blending the different worlds together. And a lot of times when I work on images like this, there's times where I'm building the image and then I tend to jump into a totally different direction. Um, there's a question. There's actually two questions. One from Cindy. She says, what is the difference between opacity and flow? Right. So the, the opacity, let me just save this. The opacity is kind of like the strength of like, if you're painting a color, so this is at 31% as opposed to 100%, whereas flow is like the strength and especially works if you're uh, working with like a Wacom tablet. And as you can see on the right, you also see like an airbrush icon. And so that so would like be- So the, like the pressure sensitivity or something or? Right, so yeah, so opacity is like how much color is being distributed and the flow is like the strength of it. So. Yeah, it works hand in hand with like a Wacom tablet, as you can see with the uh, airbrush icon. I tend to keep the flow 100 and then just focus on the opacity. Um, I think if you were to jump around back and forth, you might get kind of like mixed results. And it might not uh, be the best option for you. Okay. Now, um, Bob, curious, though, if I Bob were to go up to... Also... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, though, if I went to... 100% opacity, and then I decided to bring down the flow, and I went to like 29. It's it's similar effect. It's just um, Daniel's texting me. <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. a different. Um, it's it's a similar effect because it's based on the strength, but I tend to uh, like to use opacity because it just seems to be uh, focused more on the the strength of the distri distribution of color when I'm painting. Okay. And Andrea says flow is great for airbrush effects as well. So that's right. That's what I said with the, there's the airbrush icon up in the options bar. Mm -hmm. So that's works hand in hand with a Wacom tablet. So you can use a Wacom tablet. I, I hope you don't mind if I'm adding the comments because the folks on Facebook and in the recordings don't see the chat. So sure. um, I'll just add that Mark is saying flow is like airbrush airbrush and how much paint is coming out. I keep opacity right. high and lower the flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just focus on the opacity and don't really touch the flow so much. And then so, you know, as an example, with something like this, I'm just painting away on the layer mass to bring some of the image back. And then I would go over to the opacity and then with the scrubby slider, bring it down even lower to like 17 and then kind of let some of the image come through the middle area that's already kind of blown out. Let me get rid of that area, keep it dark. Okay, cool. Okay. Kim wants to know when choosing images to combine, do you have to choose photos with the same um, uh, lighting, like in the same lighting area? Or if not, how do you deal with light and shadow amongst the different uh, right. the various of images. Good question. Yeah. So yeah, when it, when it comes to like, if you're doing a realistic composite, it is wise to choose uh, different photos that do have the same kind of direction of light because you want that to line up and work with that. Uh, one thing that people do tend to do, and I have set up in my actions is I have a whole section for dodge and burn. So I can click on and create like a, as an example, a dodge and burn layer, which creates this, um, medium gray and it's set to soft light. And then if I hit D for default for the black and white um, foreground and background colors, I can then hover over my image. And this is just a you know basic version of that, but I can hover over my image, bring the opacity up to like 28 to 30, maybe 31. And then if it's set to black as foreground color when I paint 
here. Maybe I'll bring this down over the, uh, yeah, over the main subject. When I paint with black, you see that it darkens that area. Mm -hmm. So that's a way that you can kind of cheat when the lighting is not perfect. So you can, you know, dodging and burning is a way that you can kind of sculpt your image and sculpt the focus of the light of it. Um, and it's a way that you can also kind of add and take away light to certain areas if you don't have the proper lighting from the get-go. So as an example, if I hit X and white becomes my foreground color, I can go back and bring up the highlights of these mm -hmm. different areas, which kind of brings out the dynamics of the, uh, the image, makes it a little bit more 3D or sculptural. So now, when you pulled example, up your actions list, um, mm -hmm. those are all actions that you have created um, through your various workflows, correct? Yes, yeah, so um, throughout the years. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a mixture of, you know, like you'll see it's, it's a duplicate and then it says art 12 by 12, two, 2048 by 2048 pixels. Um, so it's a mixture of presets that I have or actions that I've made that will create new document sizes for creating art. Um, also converting to different color profiles, um, adding a quick layer mask, even though it's so easy to just click on <laughs> the layer mask icon. And then, um, you know, I've, I tend to watch a lot of uh, different uh, seminars and I've been to webinars. So throughout the years, I learned better ways of doing things. So instead of clicking on, say, an adjustment layer to convert something to black and white, I saw a, um, a webinar with Blake Rudis, who was talking about uh, using a, a gradient map as a way to create a black and mm. white. So I created a black and white gradient map for myself to convert things to black and white. And then I have simple ones for flatten when I'm creating a duplicate and I want to flatten it after a certain amount of work. Um, like I said before, I have one for guides. It gives me kind of a perfect centered horizontal and vertical guide. I also have one that says clear guides. So if I'm working on something and I don't really need that anymore, I just click that and it goes away instead of having to go up to the different sub menus. And so, yeah, that's what a lot of this is for is so I don't have to go up to menus and sub menus. I can pretty much just click on a simple button and it takes me to the function that I want. And uh, Andrea says, love those color coded organized actions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and some exactly. of them are just very basic. Some are basic, like rotating, you know, flipping horizontal. And then when I work on retouching jobs, I have one where I click and let's see. Oh, it's taking so time to, and it's a little uh, large, but if I <laughs> alt click and read, I have one that has like retouched by my name. And I realized that this is a, a great thing to do where you create a text layer with a bevel and emboss and you um, lower like the fill. The fill is zero. Right. So if I bring the fill back up to 100, it looks like a regular type layer. But if I bring it down to zero, you just see this kind of 3D oh, thing where bevel. it says, yeah, retouched by me, but it's good enough to put on any image that I send to a client so they don't try to just steal my image and not pay me. <laughs> right, exactly. So, yeah. so I've got a lot of different different kind of functional um, actions. So yeah. any, anything from basic rotation to, you know, watermarking like that. Then I have various savings, save for web, PSD, TIFF. You, know. you were saying? Okay. Um, I'm I'll kind of piggybacking off of that. Um, Bob is asking, um, what are your favorite new tools in Photoshop for lighting to make things look like they fit together? Um, so well, yeah, some things the new that, you, that are your go-tos. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing is you said um, new tools, but the funny thing is they, I believe they are getting rid of the... Um, the lighting effects that they did have in uh, Photoshop. So I know that, you know, as, as Han is saying, talking about harmonizing, so there's the neural filters. But to be honest, I've been so busy, I haven't even been able to enjoy some of the new updates that we got since Adobe Max. Um, so for me, in terms of lighting, I tend to uh, work on like a dodge and burn layer like this, where I'll paint uh, darks and highlights to kind of sculpt the light on my subject and focus or make it integrated between say different uh, lighting sources. 
hope that helps. Um, so at this point, I just wanted to kind of show what I would tend to do. Right, so uh, I think it's Ellie. Ellie is asking, is the quick selection tool that I use to isolate the sculpture head only available in Photoshop 2022? I can't find it in 2021 version. Yes, yeah, so when it comes to the object, it's called the object selection tool. That is a new uh, function, the object finder. But if I can open up, uh, let's see, not sure what the name was though. Nope, it's not it. Should have kept that uh, one open. Hmm. No, I think it's the first one, open recent. No? <laughs> okay, open recent. Uh, no, that's not that one. I'm trying to find the original of this, but I guess what I can do is since this okay, is right. a, since it's a layer mask, I can mm -hmm. always right click, mm -hmm. go to the layer itself. I can say duplicate layer and I'll just say mm -hmm. document new. Is someone speaking? Okay. And then uh, when I go here, I go over to the layer mask. I drag it down to the trash. And I'm going to say delete. So here we are basically back to the original. So with Photoshop 2022, when you go to the object selection tool and you double check your options up in the options bar and you see that it has object finders checked and you click on that refresh cycle. When you hover, you do get that blue. Um, if you are not in the latest version, if you're in Photoshop 2021, object selection tool would be more like you would hover and pull down like a rectangle and it would try to find that shape and select it pretty well um, on its own. And then you also have, of course, the quick selection tool where it's more like a brush and then you just kind of click and drag and it's set to auto add. So as you keep pulling down, drawing new brush strokes, it adds to it. And then if it overreaches like it has here, you would hold on the option key, alt on the PC, and that gives you kind of a minus sign, which means it would subtract from the selection. So as long as you hold down the option key on a Mac, alt on the PC, you'll be able to subtract that background from your selection. So I just wanted to go over those kind of tool options if you had a previous version of Photoshop. Now, one um, way of checking my selections that I use a lot, and I think uh, Teresa Jackson said it was old school, <laughs> but I've, I've been using it since it came out and I love it. Um, it's always been a very good way to uh, check how, how clean my selections are. Whenever I make a selection, be it um, anything from the rectangular or elliptical marquee with the lasso tool, or the polygonal lasso tool, or the various object selection, quick selection, or magic wand. I always check, and uh, Andrea says she loves old school, so do I. So what I do is at the bottom of your toolbar, if you click on this you know, rectangle with a circle in the middle, you'll get the options for quick mask. And what I always do is I change it from masked areas to selected areas so I can see a preview of my selected areas. And the great thing about this tool is when you're working, if say it was a red car, red Corvette, you could click here if it was set to red. So if it was set to red, you could click here and then change it to any other color. So in this case, the image is basically white or beige. Um, I tend to just keep it to bright green because it's very easy to see the edge of it. Um, but as you can see, you can go through any of the colors. So you could choose um, an orange and then when I hit OK and hit OK, then you see that kind of preview. And then you just hit Q again and you get out. So once you've set up those preferences, you just hit Q and it gives you a preview. But like I said, I like the green. It's very easy to see. So if I hit Q with any selection, I get a preview. And then I can go uh, Command plus to zoom in 
and just check my edges. And I'm not really trying to be perfect here, but at the same time, I can see what it has done. And while I'm in quick select, um, quick mask, I can just choose my brush. And then if I have black as the foreground and I paint, it's adding to the selection based on the strength of your opacity. So I bring it the opacity up in the toolbar to 100. And then I do left bracket to make it smaller. If I then paint, you'll see I'm adding to it. So I do command Z, hit X to switch white as my foreground color, and then I can erase. So the one thing that's great about quick mask is not only do you get a nice preview just by hitting Q, but you can paint, you can paint away or add to your selection by painting. So I love that kind of organic feel, you know, so I can just kind of clean up my selection holding space bar. I got a temporary hand tool and can navigate down and say, I didn't want this little kind of bump at the bottom. I can just paint with white to erase that area. And then another trick is while you're using quick mask with the brush, say I wanted this to be a little bit straighter. If I click here with my brush and then hold the shift key, it'll do like a straight line. So that's the way you can do kind of quick straight lines. So in this case, I switch to black and I want to add. So I do click, shift click, and it adds in that area. And if I overreached, I can set it to white again and just clean it up. Zoom out a little bit, space bar to pull down, Q, get quick mask. And so in this case, when I get to that point, um, as long as I choose one of the selection tools, I can then right click, choose feather. And then once again, I can add a layer mask and it knocks out the back. Great. Half a second, how much feather will you add? So um, one second. So as I said before, when it comes to uh, something that has like a sharp edge or is realistic, I will tend to, um, and let me just go back. So here we are in the selection. I zoom in. So if I right click, I choose feather. I tend to uh, choose a feather radius of like one or 0 0.8 if it's something realistic. And then I go higher for the softer I want it to be. So if I want something to blend in, like say it was a, a, a patch of grass, I might choose like four to six. But then if it's something I want to be really soft, like uh, I'm selecting a cloud to, to pull away from the background or, um, you know, something else that like a moon, if I want the moon to have a glow, then I might go up to 12 or 14. And then the thing that's nice about this is um, you can type in the number, but if you also click to the right of the number and you hit your up arrow key, you can go in uh, finer increments. So 2.3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. You know. And then if you hold, um, if I go down to say three and I hold the shift key and I hit the arrow key, it jumps to you know whole digit. So that's pretty nice. And then because it's Photoshop, it always gives us a lot of options. So if you also hover your cursor over the word feather radius, you'll see that another scrubby slider shows up. So if I click here, I can click and pull down to change the uh, pixel radius. So Photoshop's always giving us various ways to do the same thing. So, okay. Okay, so that's just that selection. So getting back to this image, hit F to get a bigger view. Kind of a kooky fine art image. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to get into uh, something that's a lot of fun utilizing with uh, camera raw through Photoshop. So I went through like the, the, you know, creative options of the different layer blending modes and talked about layer masking where you can partially uh, take away from the image or bring back by painting black or white. And then to get into uh, color grading, what I will do is I will click on the top layer. And then to make a composite layer on a Mac, I will do command option shift E and it creates a new composite layer of all the different layers as a top layer. So if I hold the option key and click on the I, it turns off all those. 
you can see. So it's just one composite layer on top. And I tend to like to do that when I do my color grading because I want to, for it to be able to focus on the, uh, the image. If you tend to go to say like the top layer, when you go to color grading, it might be reading just the, you know, the, the silvery gold and the blue that is the top layer and not all of the colors that I want in the composition. So yeah, so I'll create that composite layer, which is once again on a Mac, Command Option Shift E. So I guess on a PC, that would be Control Alt Shift E. And then once you have that, I always do a quick Command S to save. And then you just go up to Filter and then you choose Camera Raw Filter. Now, before I do that, I just wanna explain, if you're going to Camera Raw, Anything that you do to that layer would be considered destructive. That means it would be basically etched into that layer. And then if you save your image and you come back, that top layer, that's what it will be. But if you go and you right click and you convert it to a smart object, then when you choose filter, camera raw filter, it'll create a smart filter. So it'll, it'll I'll show you what it does, but it basically brings these options onto your layer, but it's not destructive. I can turn it on, turn it off. I can even add, it has a layer mask that I can add to it. So as an example, with this image, I will then go down to color grading. And uh, the way that color grading works that I really like, no, it doesn't get any bigger, is there's a couple of different options. So the first one is on the far right, if you go click on global, that's just kind of adding a tint of color to your image. And so if, uh, if I like this image, but I would like, you know, it'd be nice to have it a little bit more of a kind of a blue tint. When I click blue, it, it adds a, a, a direct blue tint over all the whole, you know, globally. So globally, it adds blue to the whole image. And the thing I love about this new color grading is that there's two ways of working. One is once you've created that point, you can just click on that point. And as you go more towards the middle, you have less of the color. So that's zero of that blue. And then as I go further out, it's more dense. So the saturation goes all the way up to 100. And as you can see, the slider moves underneath. So it's showing you that if I didn't wanna do it directly, I could just move the slider itself, which then moves that circle above as well. So you have two ways of doing it. You can move the saturation slider left or right, or if you prefer, you can just set a point and then move that towards the, the middle to make it less or towards the edge to make it higher saturation. And then of course, you're not limited to that color. You can make it, you know, more greenish, uh, orangish, more um, red or magenta. And if I thought that was too strong, I just go from that point towards the middle and decrease it. So I can add a little bit of that. But for the sake of showing you what color grading does, I wanted to show you the other variations. So if you go to the first icon, they call it three-way, you get the midtones, your shadows, and your highlights. It's nice to have them all here, but I like the fact that they also give you the option of being able to click on shadows, midtones or highlights independently. So if I look at this image and I said, mm, I like this image, but it would be nice if I could make the, the darker areas kind of a purplish blue and maybe the highlights a little bit of a, a yellowish, yellowish orange. So I could either do that directly here or I could just say, okay, shadows, let's make that purplish blue. So there it is, purplish blue. And then once again, I can click on the point. And as I pull it in, it's less strong. Or if I go back, kind of make it 100% uh, saturation. In this case, I think I'll go to like 70. So it adds a kind of nice, nice range to it, 66, I guess. And then I wanted to tweak the highlights. So if I go to the highlights, what did, uh, oh, I was reading uh, Hannah's comment, but I think she was talking about feathering. So um, with the highlights, I can then choose, like I said, a uh, orangish 
or in yellow, maybe more oranges. And then I can, once again, click that point, pull to uh, bring down the saturation a bit. And then the thing that I love about the fact that I made this a smart object first is when I hit OK, and I jump back from Camera Raw to Photoshop, you'll see that because I created a smart object first, it now has a built-in smart filter. If I go to the eyeball icon to the left of it, I can turn it off so I can see before, which is kind of very greenish yellow palette. And now it has a more magenta blue palette with that uh, tinge of orange. Orange didn't really come out that much though. Um, Ellie's asking, where did we locate the color grading again? Okay, so that's in the camera raw filter. And I will be jumping back because I wanted to show the, the beauty of using uh, smart filters. So, so first I wanted to show you that, you know, here's the smart filter. So you can turn it on, turn it off. And then you have this, this big white box is your built-in layer mask. So if I then choose a brush and I hit the right bracket a few times to make it larger. And then once again, I go to the opacity, bring it down to like 34. I can decide, let's see, I turn that off. What is it that I wanna bring back? So maybe I wanted to bring back some of the green and parts of the image. So you gotta make sure that you're in that layer mask again, which has this bit of a white frame around it. So if I'm here and then I start painting, it won't even let me paint. But if I click here and you see the frame around it, I can now paint on the layer mask. So as black as my foreground color, set to 34 opacity in the options bar, I can go back and bring back some of the green in different areas or even other kind of vibrant colors. And I can just turn off that smart filter to see what color was before. And then I make sure I click on the layer mask. And then so I paint here and I'm bringing back the green in that particular area. So you can isolate different color to kind of bring back, you know, and I like that kind of control. Now, that was a great question about the, where do you get the camera off filter? So as you can see, at the bottom of the smart filter, it says camera off filter. If I double click, I'm back in camera raw. So that's the beauty of making it a smart object first is I can get back quickly to the camera raw filter. And then I can say, you know what? I don't really like that highlight color at all. So I can then completely change it to maybe like a, um, a greenish color. And that's a little strong. So I'll just pull it back, saturation. So it's just a touch. And then when you hit okay, it updates and it's all part of the built-in camera raw filter, part of smart filters. Once again, you can always turn it off, turn it back on, and then isolate certain areas with the built-in layer mask. So the beauty of this is you could work on this and then you could save this and come back three days later. And then after three days, a week, a month, a year, you could double click that camera raw filter and you can completely change that do a tone or double color composition of color grading that you created. And that's the beauty of using a camera raw filter with camera raw. Uh, any other uh, questions about color grading itself? Feel free to ask away in the chat whenever you guys are ready. Okay. I'm just gonna fill up my glass. So uh, the question is, will using smart objects make the file size much bigger? It will make the, uh, the overall file size bigger, yes. So you, you do wanna be selective as to what you add a um, smart object to. You don't wanna make every single layer a smart object. Um, and I tend to file bigger storage is getting, that's true. As Hannah says, uh, you know, file storage is, is getting cheaper and, you know, there's much more options these days. So, um, you know, what I tend to do is I'll work on something that's multiple layers. And then the, uh, if I hit F a couple of times, um, let me see if I go to uh, image size. 
in this case, it says the image is only 12 megabytes large. So it's still pretty small. I, I made it 2048 by 2048. But if I had made it larger and you know it's at 300 pixels per inch, which is like print resolution, and I had multiple layers and I had various smart filters, it might be a larger size. But just remember that you can always work on these kind of multiple layered files as a PSD, and then you can always duplicate. So if I'm working on something like this, and then I go and I say image, duplicate, there's this thing called duplicate merge layers only, which is Adobe's convoluted, confusing way <laughs> of say flatten the copy. So I could say, and I would usually get rid of the word copy, but in this case, I'm just going to keep it. I check duplicate merge layers only, I hit OK, and then there you can see it says background. That means it's a flattened image. So all the layers go away in this duplicated file. And if I go up to the window menu, you can see that, you know, there's the original art.psd as well as some of the stock images. So the art copy is just a flattened version. So I wouldn't get too concerned about, you know, file size unless, you know, it's a 500 layered file, then it might be like two, three gigabyte large, uh, depending on its original dimensions. But as I'm showing you here, you can always make a duplicate version and then save that. And then you could even work on that. So when you get to this point, I could even um, create a new one layer. I could say uh, convert to smart object, hit F so we don't see the other thing. And then in this case, I've already had color. So I might want to kind of just work on, um, you know, adding curves to it or something. So I'll go to camera raw filter. Now here's something that um, confuses people. And this is a helpful tip. If you've been working in Photoshop and you go to filter camera raw filter, Next time you go with say a new image or you know even something that you wanna change, when you go up to filter, you see camera raw filter at the top and then you see camera raw filter down in the kind of top middle. If you go to the top middle, you're going into camera raw filter fresh. So that means you're going in as if it's new and then you can choose what to do to that image. If you choose this top one, it will be applying the last used camera raw filter settings. So just be just be wary of that, that you almost never want to use this unless you want that exact same settings. So filter, camera raw filter down at the middle area. And then here I am in camera raw. I zoom out a little bit. And then so in this case, I could once again add more color. But just to show you, the thing I love about Camera Raw is it's like its own application inside Photoshop. So besides say color grading, under the basic slider, you have like exposure, contrast, you can fix your blown out shadows, lighten up, or you can fix your blown out highlights by going negative. You can also lighten up your shadows and your, your blacks. You can add sharpening like with texture or clarity. And then if you wanted to, you can get very detailed in terms of say tonal correction. So I can use the curve here and I can set a point and just kind of pull up to lighten the midtones, go to my darks pull down. So I'm kind of adding a little contrast to it. No, it's not taking my point here. That's a bug. Okay, here. So yeah, here, if I go to, instead of this view, the parametric curve, I went to the edit the point curve, then I can place an exact point. So here I can kind of bump up the midtones, make it lighter, go to the highlights, give that a little bit of a bump, and then go down to the darks, pull that down to even make it darker if I want for contrast. And then one thing that I really love about uh, Camera Raw, and I believe it's in other different panels in Photoshop, is if you're working in any panel and you see this icon where it looks like a circle with a, a cursor, a crosshair, all you do is click on that and then you can go into your image. So without me even knowing where that tonal range is, this is your darks, your midtones, and your highlights, 
I can just go directly to my image and I can say, you know what, I want to bump up the highlights of the top of this kind of stone figure's head. So if I click here, a little, once I click, there's a little diagram with a black circle on the left, white circle on the right, or grayish white circle on the right, showing me that if I go to the right, I'm making it lighter. And if I click and pull to the left, I'm making that a bit darker, but just be aware that it also distorts the curve. So where I am in this image, I pretty much want to just make it a little bit lighter anyways, so it's not going to distort it too much. Obviously, if you go too far, it distorts and pixelates, but I just want to do a little bit of uh, that change. And the thing that's great about it is I can just move around to the other image and say, okay, well, what about this area? Maybe I want to make that a little bit darker. So you can go around the whole image and just go through the whole different tonal ranges and tweak it that way. Um, just be aware that um, if you go a little extreme, you're going to make some kind of strange curves over here and you will get uh, distortion to your pixels. Okay. But once again, I can say, okay. And then this is a new image, but you can see it also has a smart filter built in. So I can turn it on, turn it off, turn it on. It has a layer mask, so I could erase parts of it. And then once again, I could save this, come back a week later, double click where it says camera raw filter. And I'm back to that exact curve. And I could say, you know what? I think you, I overdid it. I'm gonna click on this point, bring it down just a little bit and then hit okay. So that's the really, that's the beautiful thing about um, smart objects and utilizing smart filters. Yep, the target adjustment tool is one of my favorite tools. And it's, it's also in Lightroom. So if you're a Lightroom user, you will also see that icon in different panels and you can just uh, click a point. So as an example, I believe if I go to uh, image adjustments, I go to hue saturation and I bring this panel over here, you'll see that there's also this kind of uh, icon, which is similar. And so that would mean that I could click on this and then as I go to this area, as I click, I pull to the right, I'm saturating the greens. If I pull to the left, I'm desaturating them. If I go too, too far, it'll kind of make them a bit grayish. But it's, you just got to look for the kind of different signs when they give you these different tools. But I'm a big fan of the uh, target adjustment tool in its uh, different uh, variations. Great. Any uh, questions? Far so good. So we're at top of the seven o'clock hour. Um, top of the hour. We usually, yeah, the top of the hour sounds like a radio DJ thing. Um, do we want to take a quick ten minute break and then jump back in, give everybody a, a minute to more, stretch their legs? How much more time do you need, Andrew? It could have yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty time. much the um, the range. So, I mean, so let's just have Andrew finish everything and then we'll do the raffle. We don't need a break. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. So we'll okay. go ahead and wrap it up. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that was the general range of working on this. Um, right. So Hanu was asking how late is the meeting as well. So, um, so yeah, that's just a general range of different uh, things that I'll do when I'm working on a kind of fine art or creative Photoshop composite. Yeah. Hanu wants to eat the snacks now. So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so as you can see in the layers panel, there's various layers. And so if I was then going to put this on Facebook or Instagram, you know, for me, I just go to my actions and I can click on duplicate. And I also can add a function key. So as you can see here, or maybe you can't see because it's so uh, detailed or zoomed in, <laughs> is F13. But as I showed you before, briefly, if I go up to uh, image, I can say duplicate, and then I can click on. And then, like I said, the word copy pops up and you can just highlight that and make it anything. So what I tend to do is, you know, I could call it, you know, Facebook, if I was putting on Facebook or just call it art in this case. And then there it is. And then when you look over in the layers panel, you see it says background. So it's flattened now. And then there's a couple of things I will do. So first is when I make a duplicate like this, I might go up and then 
I do have an action for it, but in this case, I might just say image duplicate. And then for Instagram, I will put like a hyphen and then type in Instagram. Instagram. And so with the first one, I will first make sure that I'm set to sRGB. And so a good way of doing that is going up to edit, convert to profile. This pops up. And in my case, I was aware that it's probably going to that needed, needed to be that color profile to go to say Facebook or Instagram. So it is already defaulted to sRGB. But if you did not do that, and it was say Adobe RGB or even pro photo RGB, cause you opened it from say Lightroom, you just go down to destination space, click the triangle on the right. And that's where you can choose sRGB in this case. But as you can see, there's Adobe RGB 1998 and various ones. I wish there was a way that you could uh, personalize this. So you could only have like the five to 10 that you use and get rid of all the ones that I'm never going to use, you know? It's I think it, it, it involves digging into your custom <laughs> settings, finding those profiles and literally deleting or moving the files out of the folder. A lot of work, right? Yeah, yeah. It'd be nice to be able to just, you know, turn them off, like turn them off and then you check the ones you want, like the four or five, you know? There, there might but, be a plugin for it. That's true. That's true too. Yeah. yeah. Who knows? Maybe now it is, but it's mm -hmm. pretty much, you know, sRGB and then I would hit okay. And that sets it to the sRGB color profile and then image, image size. And then I'm set to pixels. So this is already set to what I would put on uh, Facebook. So 2048 is a good width. In this case, it's a squared image. So it's 2048 by 2048. And then I know there's, there's debate about resolution. So a lot of people believe that when you're working on something for Facebook or Instagram or the web, you need to change the res resolution. But the funny thing is this, if I go to the resolution, which says 300, I make it 72. But I go back and make the width to what it was, 2048. 2048 by 2048 at 72 is still 12 megabytes up top. So it doesn't matter if you kept it at 300 and made it 2048, it's 12 megabytes. So you're really just concerned with the pixel dimensions. So the pixel dimensions is something that uh, you need to be aware of. Um, that's, that's what counts. That's the kind of integrity of your image for like the web. Obviously you don't want to have a 72 pixels per inch resolution that is like two inches by two inches at 72 and you're taking it to a, a print house. But even so, when you go to image size, you will see that the image size will tell you how big it is. So you always want to look for say megabytes for like best quality for print. So if you see a K in this case, 60.8 K, you know, it's way too low for print quality. So let's just go back. If I hold down the option key, I get a reset button. So I go back to 20 by 2048 by 2048. I just say, okay, I, I am where I am. I've already set it to sRGB. And then my preferred way of saving is file, export, export as. So when you do that, you get a nice new window that pops up. You can even do two up view. On the left, it says JPEG. Your dimensions, 2048 by 2048. And that tells you what size it'll be, 420, when it's set to the settings on the top right. Format is JPEG, quality is good. Now, if I wanted to see, okay, if I set it to great, I can then see down here, it says it's a 3.4 megabyte file at 2048 with great. And then if I click this one and change it from quality good to excellent, I can see that it's 1.4 megabytes. So it's two megabytes smaller. And yet if I were to zoom in, um, and I can't really see because the zoom control is, <laughs> is over my, uh, my you zoom. Can, you can click on the zoom control, click on the three dots and just drag it up out of the way. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to like close that and stop sharing. Okay, right, so right. if I hit the plus at the bottom of this 
export as window, I can zoom in a bit. And the great thing is when you zoom in and then you pull with the space bar, you'll see that the best quality or great as they call it, the great quality on the left is really not much different from setting it to excellent. So if you know that you have to conserve uh, file size, you could just choose excellent. And so in this case, I would just say preview. It brings me back to the excellent quality option and shows me it's 1.4 megabytes on the left. And then I just hit export and then save it to my desktop as an example. In this case, I'm just gonna cancel it up. So therefore, if I'm saving for Instagram, I already have it set to color profile sRGB. I just go to image, image size, make sure it's pixels. And then that's 1080. So 1080 by 1080. And then it, I always set it to bicubic sharpen and I can kind of zoom in a little bit. Now, what I tend to do though is, you know, I don't wanna to get too far into that because it seems like it's um, Hannah wants her snacks and it's time for the uh, raffle. But uh, I do have a uh, action that when I do resize, I then will go back and click on the high pass sharpen. And so for like something for Instagram, the radius will be 3.6. I then can turn it on, turn it off. And if I think it's sharpened too much, like some of the details too much, I just pull down the opacity, which is like the strength down to like around 20. And then I would like command E on a Mac, control E on a PC to flatten it, and then go back and do that same process, file, export, export as. And then I'm so used to this that it's pretty much, you choose excellent. And that's usually the right setting for good quality for Instagram or Facebook. Cool. So should I stop sharing and jump back into the... Uh, to the room well let's just double check does anybody have any last questions sure. about um what was shown this evening i thought it was an excellent uh demonstration of how to do this I, i'm i'm actually kind of curious um if you um had to go look through your full collection of everything that you've done over these last few years over uh, through all the changes of Photoshop and all the Adobe tools, what would you say are like some of your favorite processes or, or favorite things that you're utilizing Photoshop for? Is it the editing? Is it the compositing? Is it touch up work? What What is your favorite thing? So yeah, I didn't, didn't really have time or focus to get into the, uh, the neural filters, which is what Hannah was um, kind of talking about a bit. But there's some pretty cool neural filters, which are a lot of the uh, Adobe Sensei um, artificial intelligence that will change your image for you. And you can change the coloring and, um, you know, you can, uh, I believe you can create like a smile or you can change the age of a person, like in a portrait. Those are pretty cool. But um, like I said earlier, one my favorite uh, change is that color grading. Color grading... Um, Used to, I think it used to be sliders or even kind of very limited. And then they created those circular diagrams. And I just love the uh, ease of use. And it just seems perfect for like a visual artist. You know, you can click on the, the circle of color, choose, and then kind of move it in or out. Um, of course, you have the sliders right underneath, but it's, it's just kind of great to be able to work that both ways. And I do, I love the fact that, um, you know, I'm not sure if people know, but the when you go to filter, camera raw filter inside Photoshop, that's literally the same processing engine that you'll see like in uh, Lightroom class. Lightroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you'll see a lot of the same exact tools. So the same color grading is in both platforms. Um, Alex and Patrice both have a couple of quick questions. They're just asking you to review again, how do you use the high pass to improve the sharpness? And again, what is the difference between object finder and select subject? Okay. So yeah, okay. so if, if you didn't, if you don't have my actions, which you most likely don't, <laughs> um, you would have to do this in, you know, step by step, but the, it's pretty easy, just the high pass sharpen when I click on it, all it does is it creates a um, like a neutral gray uh, layer. 
So you would say edit, fill, and choose 50% gray. And then you choose the high pass filter. And then I set it to the, the um, radius of 3.6 as a default. And then when it changes the color, the uh, layer blending mode to overlay, that's where it kind of knocks away the gray and you see the effect. So when it's set to overlay, like if I go back to like normal, you'll see it's kind of grayish because it's the gray layer with a, a 45% opacity. So set to overlay and knocks out the gray and you just see the kind of sharpened kind of quality it gives. But the thing I'm looking for when I use it is I turn it on and I turn it off. And if I think some of the detail areas are too sharp, too bright, then I go up to the opacity and I, with the scrubby slider, I pull it down to around 20, 21, turn the eye on and off and see if I got a little bit of a sharpen, but not too much that it might be kind of, you know, pixelating or distorting. And then when I like it, I do a command E to merge down and then I'll save it. And then there was a question about object finder and select subject. So yeah, so if I have a, um, let me go back to this one again. Command D, zoom in, hit F key. So we're in that. Move that down. Okay. Um, I think you might have muted yourself. Hi. Let's see. Oh, there you go. Okay. okay. We Great. can hear you. Okay, cool. Okay, so here I am in this just as the example. If I go to where is it? I go to object selection tool, which is the first one and it has like this kind of cursor with a square. Um, once I choose that in the options bar up top, I see that there, as long as you are in Photoshop 2022, you'll see the object finder option and it's checked. And then you have this kind of refresh thing. So if I click the refresh, it's like telling Photoshop to read my image once again, to read it with the AI. And so it's, doing that. And then when I hover without even clicking, just hovering, I get this blue highlighted kind of mask overlay to show me um, what it's going to do if I click. So if I do click and move my cursor away, it, it did a pretty good job at isolating the subject from the background. And then from there, I can right click, choose like a one pixel feather and then click on the layer mask icon and knock the background out. I think that's kind of freaky about it is even after you've added a layer mask, it's still at giving you that kind of highlighted um, preview of the mask because you're still in the uh, object selection tool. Now, if I do command Z and I get out and I do command D to deselect, if I right click and choose quick selection tool, then I can just click and drag and keep clicking and dragging to select my subject. And then option click to erase the background, right? So the first is an automatic and AI driven and the second is a manual process. That's right. Okay. Well, I do believe they were also asking about select subjects. So once again, if you're in any of the, these tools, so if I'm in the first tool, the object selection, you do see the button for select subject. If I'm also in the quick selection tool, you still see the same button. So if I click on select subject, it does the same type of thing. It's still reading your image for you and trying to isolate mm. your subject from the background. Now, once again, the thing that we love about Photoshop is so many options to do the same thing. If you go over and I already have it open, but if you go to your properties panel, and in general, if you ever need any panel, you go to window and there are all your panels. So if you open up Photoshop and your layers panel was missing, you would just go to window layers. So in this case, I go to window properties and there's the properties panel. And you'll notice that that also under quick actions and if it's collapsed, just click on the triangle, has two options, select, select subject. So if I click that, it's the same function again, isolates the subject from the background. Or if I'm in a layer and I click on remove background, not only does it select the subject, but it will automatically add a layer mask for you. 
So mm. this is quite great. This, these, these new functions in the properties panel, these quick actions are excellent. So why work so hard when you have things uh, like that? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so who was, you were mentioning about some filters, I think besides the color grading, you said there are some filters that Hannah likes a lot. That is like an oh, yeah. AI kind of. What was the name of it again? Okay, so let's see here. Let me go in there. Let me go back to my image before. Filter. Okay, so if I go to filter, the third mm -hmm. section down says neural filters. And then up mm -hmm. comes its own panel. It's loading right now. And, you'll and see that's that the new version. The 2022, yeah, so in, right? Right. I'm in Photoshop 2022. So, you know, if you're in Photoshop 2021, you might have different uh, options. And the way that mm -hmm. this works is you do have to turn on, say, like if you wanted to work on the skin smoothing one, you have to kind of click that button to the right. And mm -hmm. that kind of uploads it from, the, I guess, the Adobe Cloud. Um, and okay. then you have like, artifacts removal, colorize, style transfer. I mean, this is kind of a, a whole session in itself. Maybe we'll get Hannah to wow. do this one. Right? <laughs> Hannah's Hannah, like, you Hannah's want, are you still here? You want to do that? <laughs> Unmute yourself, girl. <laughs> Jump in. <laughs> she said yes, yes, Thank yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was <laughs> yeah, that's quite cool. So, but one thing I also want to show you, if, if I'm here and I also go to filter and I go to liquefy, this is one thing that's pretty cool too. I zoom in a little bit, command plus a couple of times. Hopefully it'll read it because it's not really a, a, a portrait. It's more of a sculpture. But um, if I go down to smile under mouth, and it's not, I don't think it's doing it. That's too bad. If it was like a real yeah. portrait of someone, I would be able to change the eye size. So if I have like a little bit of a lazy eye, I can open up one eye just with these sliders. So you can change the eye size, the eye height, the eye width, the tilt of the eye, the distance between the eyes. You can change the for your nose the height and the width and then you can give yourself a, a smile or take down the smile you can give yourself you can a do little, some evil with that uh -huh. yeah, you can just you oh, can yeah. add some digital botox or you can <laughs> make your upper and lower lips bigger or smaller um yeah and you could like change the jaw structure you know the face mm -hmm. shape forehead so it's too bad it's not letting me do it because it's, it's seeing that it's not a real person it's like a sculpture but it does have portraiture features. But yeah, forehead, chin height, jawline, face width, pretty cool stuff though. So if you if you tend to uh, have people take your portrait and you don't smile, you can add a smile in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Where was that? That was one of the uh, neural? No, this for that one itself, and that works great for, um, for portraits, is liquefy. So filter, liquefy. It has a whole section just for face aware liquefy, eyes, nose, mouth. Um, but just also to show you, like if you're doing retouching and say a model says, can you move in my hips a little bit? If you choose like the first tool, you go over to your image and you have a bigger brush like this, you can push in pixels like that. Just be aware that the more you do it, it will distort some of the background pixels. But um, it's pretty cool. I've used it a lot for different uh, retouching jobs. And Is it really a, any good? I remember when they were demoing uh, some smart filters that it turned out they only really worked on the demos that, uh, that Adobe was doing on the files that were preset for that. I, I do think that they're very sincere about the development of all this, though. So, so they are putting a lot of energy into, you know, Adobe Sensei artificial intelligence. And it is getting better and better with with each new uh, upgrade. And um, I do think that like, you know, in the beginning, it might have been, a, to be honest, a little awkward. And then in time, it is getting pretty exact. And I do think that when you use some of these, you know, selection tools, like for select subject, it is now reading hair a lot better than it used to in its first stages or its first implementation of it. So. Right. Even along those lines, um, I think, let's see, Carl was asking, how well do those selection tools work with a subject that doesn't have such clear edges like tree branches or hair? I think yeah, it works so great. Andrea's how, uh, 
Oh, yeah. Um, Carl says, how well do those selection tools work with a subject that doesn't have such clear edges like tree branches or hair? Right. Exactly. So yeah. tree branches or hair, it's, it's, it is obviously more difficult. And um, that's where you'd have to go in and let's see if I do um, select subject. You know, this is obviously very clear, but uh, close that. If I then choose like one of the, you know, selection tools, I then see that there's like select subject, select and mask. So the first step might get you there 80% to 90% of the way, if it's a difficult selection, such as hair or you know, tree branches. And then with a selection tool selected, you would go up to your options bar and you'd have to click on select and mask. And that's where, you know, you could say, um, high quality preview. I don't know if you must remove that, but that's where you'd have to kind of tweak these settings to go in and like paint to kind of bring more detail or select more of the hair or the tree branches. That's kind of like a, another le whole session in itself. Um, well, yeah, select. I get out of that. That select and mask is how you would kind of take it into the next zone. And then I did see a comment from, from Andrea. No, yeah. when it comes to those tools, I, I don't think you need to um, have the subject selected. Like if I have this selected now and I go up to filter liquify, I don't think it's going to let me. Yeah, see, it's not going to let me do anything to the face, like the eyes or the mouth. I can't, I can't give it a smile because it's not reading it as a real human being. Um, okay. And then what are the tools? I have a have? question. I see a bunch of questions popping up. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Go ahead, Is go ahead, Ellie. Ellie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm trying to use the tool that you were just mentioning. And every time I do it, it asks me to download, like a, to download it. And when I do download it, it quits. So is, does it mean that my system is not capable of, pro maybe it needs a lot more memory or something? I'm on a MacBook Pro. But right. it, it's crashed like three times already. Like I can't bypass, you yeah. know, just, you know, I go and I click it and I download it and then it quits. So I think, I think one thing that you might have to um, tweak is under the preferences, under technology mm -hmm. previews. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's something about... Not product improvement, but maybe under enhanced controls. No, but there was something where you can turn off like the, the GPU. Oh, the okay. So I know where it is in say... Premiere Pro, but not in Photoshop. Yeah. Performance. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, performance. Yeah, I'm performance. right there. Exactly. Right. So yeah, under performance it says use graphics processor. So if you're having problems, mm -hmm. you might have to turn that off. Um, obviously make Got sure it. you're on the most updated version of Photoshop. And then, um, you might have to do a test of turning off use graphics processor, hitting, okay, quitting Photoshop and then relaunching it. And then seeing if you can access the neural filters or upload them easier. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an right. issue with that for sure. It shouldn't be, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be like crashing your Photoshop. Well, One of the other things that we usually say in, in the Adobe uh, forums is we highly recommend when someone has technical issues with the software to sign out of Creative Cloud, uh, mm -hmm. restart the computer, That's sign true. back in, and then make sure you're running up uh, updated. And it usually does come back a little bit stronger. Yeah, a lot so, of the kind um, of like restarting works, restarting Photoshop, restarting Creative Cloud. That could right. Uh, are these neural filters a separate download from Photoshop 2022? No, uh, they're no. built in. Yeah, built in. Well, on 21, it asked me to download them. So that could be the problem maybe because it's as, it's not, it's showing up, but when I go and click on it, it says, okay, you, you download it. And there is another set that it's on beta at the bottom. So I think right. maybe it's because I'm on the older version, maybe. 
Yeah. But Ellie, we've got uh, the campus uh, subscription. You are more than welcome to yeah, go ahead and try yeah. that oh. update and see if it works. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I'm waiting for the end of the semester so nothing disastrous happens when you're out there. Amen. <laughs> but, one, but one thing to be aware of, one thing to be aware of is, you know, when I, I just went to filter neural filters and open this up, um, I mm. haven't even turned on smart portrait. But if you look over in the top mm. right, it says smart portrait, this filter processes image data in the cloud. So what's happening is it's sort of like it's interacting with Adobe and, and getting information from the cloud mm -hmm. coming back to you. And so, yes, if you don't have enough, uh, you know, GPU power, mm -hmm. you might have issues. Um, so you just mm -hmm. be aware that, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think basically older uh, Macs or PCs and not having enough memory or a strong GPU, you could have problems with this whole kind of um, neural filters. That's true. Uh, do you anticipate that being an issue on a uh, four gigahertz uh, 2015 iMac? 2015. Um, I think it should 20. be good. I think it should be good. Um, but in general, what you might have to do is do some uh, search. You might have to do a search and says, you know, look type for that. the Adobe specs. Right. Would 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 the 2015 you know PC be compatible with the neural filters, and then it might have a link that you go to and it gives you more information and then might have some suggestions of what you need to do. So it might say, yes, you need to go to preferences and turn off under performance, turn off use graphics processor. And in other cases, it might tell you to make sure that's on. So that's why it's always good to kind of search and see what it, how it relates to your setup. And I did see a uh, Charles ask, um, I have some old Kodachrome images. There's a lot of dust and uh, crud or scratches on them. And the new neural filters help get rid of dust better. Um, I'm not sure if I saw that neural filters. I know that they do have one called um, skin smoothing. So if I turn on skin smoothing, it, you know, the AI reads it. And then uh, if I pull the smoothest slider to the right, it cleans it up a little bit. Um, but what is myself, style transfer? I but, but before I get to that, I just wanted to kind of answer that question. Is um, yeah. I myself, if I'm working on something, and this is not a great example of that, but you know, if I see this as dust and scratches, I'm a bigger fan of going to filter, noise, noise and then you can noise. do uh, despeckle or dust mm -hmm. and scratches. Just be aware that basically what these um, filters are doing. Is just blurring your image though. So you obviously want to have a duplicated layer above your image. So let me just do that. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I create a new duplicate layer above, and then I might go to filter, noise, dust and scratches. And then as I move the radius up, you can see it's it's literally blurring the image. You know, that's what it does. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I if I hold down and pull to the right, it's making it a little bit blur. So if I turn, turn off the eye, it's also kind of lightening it a bit too, which is interesting. But what I could do is I could say, okay, this is the top layer. I add a layer mask, I choose my brush. I make sure my opacity is set to about 30 and black is my foreground color. I turn on, turn off my image. And then I say, okay, well, what needs to come back? And I go back and I just paint back the detailed areas, left bracket to make my brush smaller. And so I might bring back certain areas and let other areas that I wanted to clean up the dust and scratches um, remain. So I'm just going to like highlighted areas, you know, nose, eyes, eyebrows, hair areas. If this was a person with hair, <laughs> the, um, the main thing is that. So, so yeah, I know, um, didn't want to get too far. Well, let's do the raffle now. Right. Sure. Right. Sure. I, I didn't want to get too far off, but I wanted to answer something. <laughs> well, what is that style transfer? Um, let's let's answer that question right after we do the raffle. We'll stay okay. online for a little bit more. We just want to give everybody an opportunity before it gets a little bit too late. But in general, I hope that was good. The uh, presentation. Excellent. Yes. Thank it you. It was great. <laughs> So well, the, thank you the so much. <laughs> so the first spin is going to be for your Creative Cloud. 
And then the second prize after that will be for 15 free Adobe stock images. Oh, cool. Okay, so are you ready? Get it, get it, get it. <laughs> Shoot. Who gets to click? <laughs> What's going on? I see some that names that? repeated. That's not that's not good. Doug's name is like uh, six times. Well, I bought extra tickets. Okay, <laughs> thank you. That makes sense. That makes sense. Good. Doug, Congratulations, Doug. Doug. Good nice. job, Doug. Woo woo. Doug, I need you to send me a private message on this chat with the email address you wanted to set it to, oh, and yeah. I'll set this up right now. And you should hear from them within two weeks. Uh, attention to who? Send a private message to me on the chat on here. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to. Uh, I'll, I'll help chat. you with that. Okay. Actually, yeah, Daniel, send him a private, and then when he sees it, when he responds to you, it'll be private. Okay, now. You ready for the next one? Okay, let's do the next one. I got you, Doug. Ivory. Congratulations, job, Ivory. Woo -woo. Woo -woo. Thank you. Ivory, send me a private message with your Adobe okay. ID. Adobe ID. Adobe ID. Adobe ID. So that's what it what all do you need? That's what it I need your Adobe ID. I need your Adobe ID. address so they can ask so they can ask you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. That's Ivory's. That's Ivory's. <laughs> I can't figure this out. I can't figure this out. That's a crazy loop. That's a crazy loop. <laughs> That's okay, Ivory. I'm going to type okay, you a Ivory, message. I'm going to type you a message. Okay. And you can reply to that. And you can reply to that. Daniel, are you all done? Okay, Daniel, are you all done? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No more echoes. Oh, <laughs> that was on, on I wanted to hear. <laughs> Darn. That's like, <laughs> that's better than helium. <laughs> Creating okay. our own like DJ booth here, you know? Mm hmm okay. okay. Doug, you're fine. You can go ahead and just, um, in that direct message, just type back with your email address. And let's see, uh, Alex is asking, when will the next meeting be? Right now we have uh, a meeting scheduled for January 6th with Mark Heaps, and he will be doing a, another Photoshop uh, presentation, but he's got a whole um, amazing workflow, and uh, we love watching Mark present. Mark is absolutely amazing as well, so be he's sure to max, put that in your calendar. max presenter too. Right? Yeah, he's a, he's a max master come to think of it yeah yeah well deserved so, yeah. yes very much so um let's see got you doug we got you um ivory we're just waiting for your response as well um daniel do you have any more on the um the raffle or are you all good oh, all good just those prizes today okay nice. and you um, doug's doug and ivory's emails i got it you're um, filling it out right now. Okay. Oh, okay. And so then, someone was asking about the um, yes. I sharing my screen. Uh, you can, can you still you can still share. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you see Photoshop? Okay. So uh, you're, you're not about sharing these? yet. Okay. Yeah, it hasn't started yet. Okay. Um, everyone, you're, feel free to uh, unmute if you have any last questions or want to see any other um, uh, short demos or anything along those lines. We're at the, the back end of the presentation now. So, I had a question. Um, sure. One of the one of the things that you were uh, illuminating me about was talking about old and new uh, uh, cloud, and you got me finding that uh, I'm on 21 and not 22. So all that that you were talking about was new to me. The, uh, do I have to update that manually or 
can you help me to understand what's going on? Right. So if you go to your, you have the creative cloud uh, icon in the top right of your desktop. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So you'd click on that and then the uh, panel pops out. Uh -huh. And then what I, what I always tell people is you'll see on the left, it says all apps and then updates. If you click on updates and then you go to the top right and you do check for updates, that is the best way to see the most updated uh, Adobe apps. And so it doesn't, doesn't check for updates. So it doesn't it's... send you a signal, uh, send you a message or update automatically? Anissa, I think it's like highlighted, um, right? You, it, It's highlighted. You can set uh, your Creative Cloud uh, apps to automatically update. But if you have had, I don't know about anybody else, but I know I've had um, points in time where a particular update was not well done. And I wanted to not take that chance, like Ellie was giving That's as true. an example. She didn't want any to take any chances up until a certain point where she knew she'd be more flexible. So she um, kept the previous version and let an update run yeah. that would install a completely different instance. And that's perfectly acceptable. As long as you've got the yeah. hard disk space and the RAM to run them, uh, that will work on your system. So Great. thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I yes, learned sir. that lesson the hard way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Never change versions in the middle of a project. Painful, painful lesson. Helicopters that way. Right. And Ellie's then, like totally thumbs up. Right. And then uh, a few people were asking about the uh, the tools that look like the multicolored infinity symbols. Right. So, um, you know, I showed you about color grading through the camera raw filter. So that's the way that you can through, you know, utilizing Photoshop, or if you're in Lightroom, you can access the, the color grading functions. But there are people who sell different products similar to that. And so those that you saw were the infinite color panel. And I do have like a link. Um, in fact, if um, you follow me on Facebook and send me a message, so Andrew Cavanaugh on Facebook, and I also run the Photoshop and Lightroom group. If you follow me, send me a message, say I'm interested in those um, infinite color panel. There is a Black Friday discount coming out uh, next week. So I'm, I should be getting new information on Monday. I will then create a, a newsletter that I put out every year for Black Friday. I'm, I'm also, uh, to be transparent, I'm an affiliate with Infinite Color as well as Photoshop Cafe, Photoshop Training Channel, Dave Cross, uh, Summerana and various people. So I usually can get some good discounts for people by doing that. And so the way infinite color works is similar to the color grading that I showed you. You literally create a layer, you go up to the infinite color, you click it, and then you choose like basic, intermediate, or uh, intense. And then you just literally click the button and it cycles through a series of adjustment layers that will change the color grading of your image. So for me, what I'll do is I'll create my art and then at the end, I'll go and I'll create a composite layer at the top and then I'll click on the um, infinite color panel and it'll cycle through different color variations and I'll just keep clicking until I found a color variation that just really captures the essence of what I've created. And then of course, you can click and add a adjustment, a, a layer mask to it and then paint out certain areas. So I could add like a purplish, whatever, a purplish blue infinite color uh, panel layer, add a layer mask, and then take it out of areas that I want another color to pop through. So it's just a nice way to um, have different color variations at a click of a button. It's just a nice way where you don't have to think about it. So can we revisit those uh, neural filters? Uh, it's, I was going to say it's getting a little bit late, though. So I, I really think that uh, Daniel should reach out to uh, Hannah and have Hannah do a whole session on neural filters. Okay. Yeah, right? we'll do that, but it'll be oh, like that uh, works for me. For now, I'll touch base. But if you me. also message me on Facebook, I can, uh, you know, either talk, uh, type out some steps for you, or even suggest certain uh, YouTube uh, videos. Doug. 
Okay. Yeah. No, I, 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 I can wait a couple of, couple of months and, uh, you know, or whatever, and let the bugs hammer out anyway. <laughs> yeah. Or in a week, message me in a week. <laughs> so I will, I hope, I hope that was uh, helpful for everybody. I did try to uh, focus on a range from beginner to advanced. Um, and hopefully everyone got a little something from it. Yeah. I'm, I'm throwing up hearts. That's how I do. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Andrew, thank, thank you so you much. Again. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, um, yeah, thanks um, for everybody, we, we appreciate up. everybody coming out. Yes, this was fantastic. Thank you for your participation, your questions. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, join us on Facebook and YouTube for the recording. If you want to watch anything back, definitely follow that dude, Andrew. And make sure you're um, uh, joining in the groups and seeing the, the discussions going on there. And then this recording is live on our Facebook uh, LA Web Professionals group as well. So, and let me just and, say, yeah, let me just say that if you wanted to also find me, it's either Andrew Cavanaugh on Facebook or digital artist Andrew Cavanaugh, and then yeah. you'll find my business page. You can send me a message and I'll I put it in the chat. Send me like some, great. <laughs> there we go. Cool, cool. All right. Well, everyone, thank yep. you for joining us. Have a great week. Everybody stay safe. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, thank Ali. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Carl. Have a good Bye, one. Susie. Gotcha. Charles. Good Bye. to see you, Alan. Great to see you. Very cool. Hannah, thanks. Mark, thanks. Drea, thanks. <laughs> Charles, good to see you. Thank you. Bob, we appreciate you. <laughs> Andrea was coming in and out. Ivory, congratulations. Thanks again. And Doug, I should say, even though know, I should have I should have said it before, but Hannah is doing a live on Friday. Doing a live on Friday. With my group. With my group. Oh. Okay, oh. well, we can put it in okay, the follow-up. Well, we can put it in the follow-up. Ivory, are you there? Ivory, are you there? Yes. Okay. Did you have a question? Okay, we did still you got your question because we still got your echo. Uh -oh, we got the echo. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you and congratulations you again. And congratulations again. <laughs> what did I win? The stock was it? Daniel? Stock was yeah. Daniel? Yeah. What did Ivory win? What did Ivory win? 15 stock. 15 <laughs> stock. <laughs> oh, okay. Very cool. Very cool. Thank Very you. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Drea, are you still there? Yes, ma'am. You well, still on it? I forgot. She's a night owl. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay. you, everybody. <laughs> and once you.